what uh, we shall prove now that uh, there are languages which are recursively enumerable, but not recursive. So, we will try to prove existence of RE or existence of languages which are RE that is recursively enumerable, but not recursive. In particular, we will show that L u is R e, but not recursive. Definition of the language L u is, if you recall, is this that set of so this 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 notation stands for that you are given as input a string which encodes a pair and first element of that pair is the code of some machine turing machine m and the second one is a string w So, we will show that this language to be recursively enumerable, but not recursive. And therefore, if we go back to the picture that we drew last time, that this square box, if you imagine it to be the set of all languages over sigma, subset of it is recursively enumerable languages, and it is a proper subset because we had seen the diagonal language L d is of course, a language over sigma, but it is not recursively enumerable. So, we have a set of R e languages and then by definition set of recursive languages will be a subset of R e languages, because uh, it comes from definition, because you see a recursive language is a language which is accepted by a Turing machine, which halts on all inputs. The first condition that a language is accepted by all, excuse me, uh, a language which is accepted by a Turing machine means it is a RE language. So, recursive lang languages are by definition recursively enumerable languages. So, we drew a subset and the question is that whether this subset is a proper subset whether the set of recursive languages that set is a proper subset of the set of all recursively enumerable languages. When we prove this that L u is recursively enumerable, but not recursive, we show the separation between these two sets recursive and recursively enumerable. We show that the separation is strict and in fact, L u is such a language which is R e, but not recursive. So, you can see that we need to do two things to show that L u is R e, that is point 1, the point 2 is L u is not recursive and we will do it one by one. So, let us first prove that L u is R e. Uh, the way we prove this that L u is R e by demonstrating something uh, which is very important, but fairly simple. It is the existence of universal Turing machines. So, right now we are trying to prove that L u is R e and for the proof of this statement, we will first of all uh, require that a particular kind of Turing machine, which is called universal Turing machine, such a Turing machine exists. In fact, the name uh, 
LU, LU stands for, this U stands for universal. Now, what is a universal machine? Universal machine is one fixed Turing machine, which can simulate other Turing machines, so far as language recognition is concerned, for the purpose of language recognition. That is, the simulation should be such that, that this fixed machine will be able to tell you, whether uh, any given M accepts its own input or whatever input you have given to that machine M uh, or not. So, essentially universal Turing machine, so if I write it like this abbreviation UTM, so UTM is a fixed machine, fixed TM and uh, what such a TM can do is that such a TM, so this is your UTM, it is on its input tape, two things will be given. One is the code of a Turing machine and a particular string W and this UTM will decide or not decide really, this what it will do is that it will simulate the working of M on W step by step and because it is simulating M on W step by step, if ever M accepts W, UTM will know that M would have accepted W and therefore, it would accept its input. Now, its input was this pair M W. So, this UTM therefore, the language accepted by UTM by the way we have described it is clearly LU. By now, it should not be very surprising to you uh, how, uh, why such a, such a machine exists. So, let us see. After all, what do we mean by we have given the code of a Turing machine M. Code we said that is uh, something we have done before. Code of a machine is in terms of its quintuples and uh, so the code code of M is really a string which is essentially the quintuples of that machine. Each quintuple is coded, if you recall, as a five tuple of numbers. Each number was represented in a unary form, all that we know. These quintuples were separated by uh, some double zeros. This is quintuple 1, quintuple 2, etcetera, right. <coughs> and we have some further, uh, let us say, conventions that is the state uh, numbered 1 or numbered 0, maybe we can start with 0, state numbered 0 basically what otherwise you would have called as Q 0, whose such a state numbered 0 that means, it is the number is 0 and it is uh, representation in unary is 1 this state is the initial state and we also said the state numbered one is the unique accepting state all right now so this UTM, what will it, what will it have, is maybe it will, it will have a few other tapes. And what one of these tapes will be is to carry the coding of the tape 
of m as it works on w right so imagine this last tape is the coding of the tape we are assuming m is a one tape machine and uh, the code of the, that tape will be appearing here. Now, why do we not directly work with the tape as M would have seen it or as M's tape? See, so, the reason is UTM is a fixed machine. and it has a fixed alphabet. The problem, basic problem that non matching of UTM tape alphabet with the alphabet of M by uh, the in the manner in which we coded M itself, because you see even for the quintuples of M we need to state the symbols that M uses. So, we do not really use the symbols directly, they are then that those symbols as such are of no importance, but if we what we code them by unary numbers and therefore, since 0 and 1 we are assumed to be in the tape alphabet of UTM, we can at least express the coded version of every symbol. Uh, of M for UTM to work on. So, this this tape as I said this last tape is the coding of the tape of M on W right. Without any loss of generality you may assume that sigma is that is the input alphabet of M is a subset of the tape alphabet. Also, we can assume that blank symbol, okay, that is we say the blank symbol is same, that is the same symbol, let us say the same symbol acts as the blank symbol for both M and the machine UTM universal Turing machine. So, non blank portion initially will have W. So, what, what UTM can right away do that it can copy the W in the beginning here and also it can copy let us say after some special symbol the code of M. Code of M recall will be the quintuples of 1, quintuple 1 followed by quintuple 2, quintuple 3 and so on that is the code of the machine right and let us also say that this part so before this dollar it uses something the space here you can imagine that it will use this part will store the current symbol so let us say or the coding of the current symbol Okay, so, let me write it as S to say coding of the current symbol and this part which may be a number of cells all these are it will consist contain coding again in unary of the current state okay. and these two are separated by two zeros. All right. So, let me draw this part a little more clearly here for 
better readability what we are saying is our intent is this part will have code of present state and this part will have code of the symbol. Currently being read by M. So, see we are saying present, the word we are using present, the we are using the word current. So, we, this is in the context that we imagine that M which you want to simulate is working on W and it is going from step to step. At every step it has, it is in some state that is the code that is the state present state of M. So, let us say code of present state of M and at that time a particular beginning of a move of M, M is reading a particular symbol and its code appears here. Then what we have said that there is this dollar and here we have code of M. Right? Recall as I said that code of M is nothing but quintuples one after another. In the beginning, what is, what will be in the beginning in the sense, in the beginning of M's work on W, the state is going to be the initial state which we just said is the 0th state and that code of that state is just the number, just the string, uh, I mean unary string 1 and here code of the current symbol. So, here whatever is the symbol in W, the first symbol let us say A and as we said the tape, you do not need to code sigma. So, it is uh, you can say the A is there, right. Now, we will just have the convention, we are just making one convention and that we can follow that in the in coding the quintuples, if a symbol from sigma appears that will write directly, we would not code it in unary. All right. So, this is there and uh, otherwise the tape therefore, the, the, the tape coded version of the tape of M as it works on W would consist of symbols from sigma which we will directly write and you know we can uh, we can have some coding for symbols which of course, they are not there in not in sigma those symbols will code them in unary and separate them by some special symbol. So, let us say some cent and then okay. and then here it we may have something like a b 1 you know maybe 0 which is okay. So, this is how the coded or the last or the lowest tape of UTM, lowest step is this one, step of UTM will look like something like this. Of course, there will be lots of blanks because blank symbols are common for both. Now, you see, so what we said is initially suppose the symbol A is the first symbol of W that we can copy in this part, 
which is the expanded version here. And this we call the buffer region. So, buffer contains the code of the present state of M, code of the symbol currently being read by M. And now, what would be the action of M when it is in this, this state and reading the this symbol? That is defined precisely by a quintuple whose first two components are these two, right, separated by two zeros. We also assume that you know there is no confusion that these two zeros are separating uh, the, the, the coding of the state and coding of the thing, the symbol. All right. So now at any given time, so now imagine dynamically what is the situation, how does UTM simulate the working of M on W. At any given time, M would have been scanning a particular symbol and it will be in some particular state. At that, for that, at that time the buffer would be filled in the appropriate manner. And now, UTM would like to know what would be the next state of M, what is the symbol that will be written and what will be the direction of move. So, in general, the UTM would this the head of this tape will be scanning the leftmost of the code of the current symbol being scanned. So, as I said so, and then these these are appropriately written, imagine that that has happened. And now, by scanning the code of M, UTM would know what would have been the next state, right. So, the next state suppose is the third state. So, therefore, this has to be updated by the code of that state 3, which is of course, the num the, the unary representation of 3 is 4 1. So, so we write that. And now, it also knows from the code of M, you see, which is the next, the, the symbol to be printed. So, let us say the symbol to be printed is the seventh symbol. So, that is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So, the number 7 is of course, represented in unary by 8 ones. So, this part will come here. And now, what UTM would do is to appropriately update two things here. See, somewhere that at, at this position, the whatever was what was there previously is the content will be the code of the symbol that was just read in its place this should come. So, essentially it should copy this part here. Now, only problem is you know this may be of the lengths may mismatch right, this may be small, the code of that symbol may be small and code of this new symbol to be written there is large. So, it has to shift some symbols to accommodate all these. Similarly, it might have to push some symbols from right hand side to create a smaller space, if the new symbol to be written there had a code whose length is less than the code of the symbol that was previously there. So, this is correctly updated and again the appropriate quintuple would say that whether the head will move to the left or to the right. So, if it is move, if it is supposed to move to the left, you know it will Supposing it was here, so it updated the correctly the symbol that it was reading previously and then it positions itself to the beginning of the this code of the symbol which M state would have appeared left to the present or the symbol. right? So, now it comes here 
and we are back in the beginning of the simulation of a another next step of M, because correctly now we have the present state, the present symbol and the head is at the right place and this will go on. Some details need to be worked out because of the way we said that you know in not all uh, symbols are codes of coded, but some symbols are directly written. So, in that case if it sees a symbol which is directly written, then it will just move one step otherwise if it was to move left, otherwise it will move back to the previous sent sign and then position itself appropriately. So, what I am trying to say that this is not difficult to see that every step of m on w can be simulated by the UTM with a number of steps. So, therefore, if ever m goes to an accepting state as it works on w, UTM would know that because you see every time whenever the new state information is comes here, it can check whether it is the accepting state or not. If the accepting state is reached, then m would accept or rather the UTM would accept its input. UTM's input was recall m and w. So, what are the inputs it is accepting? It is accepting those inputs such that m accepts w. So, precisely it is accepting the language LU and uh, since we have a Turing machine to accept the language LU, they, that shows that the language LU is recursively enumerable. So, we have shown the existence of UTM proves that LU is R. It is very clear that the only inputs UTM would accept, the UTM would accept its input only when in this in the during the simulation it finds the accepting the accepting state would have been reached by the machine which is being simulated. Otherwise, it will just carry on with another step of simulation of this machine that is being simulated. So, since it accepts all and only inputs m w such that m accepts w, it precisely accepts the language l u. So, first part of our job in proving existence of recursively enumerable languages which are not recursive is done because our candidate for that was LU and we have proved that LU is recursively enumerable. What is now left is to show that LU is not recursive. Our next task is to show LU is not recursive. Now, this is very simple because you see idea is if LU was recursive, then LD would become recursive. Why? Recall what was LD? LD was this language. These are all binary strings. The, the machine whose code is x and we had proved that L D is not even R E recursively enumerable, right. 
So, now imagine LU is recursive, assume LU is recursive. So, then we would have a Turing machine M, some Turing machine M, which would say yes on an input like this M W, it will always halt and saying yes if m accepts w and no if m does not accept w. Right? If L u is recursive, then such a Turing machine would be there. All right, because LU is recursive means LU would be accepted by a Turing machine which always halts and therefore, if it halts in a non accepting thing state you know that M does not accept W, if it halts in an accepting state then M accepts W. Now, what you can do therefore, imagine something like this that suppose you had some x. Now, x from here you have very simple transformer which codes x x. So, from x it creates a pair x and x right, but now you can think of this x is a code of a machine and this x is a input to that machine. And now, here you have m and if m would have said yes, that m would have accepted, that means, the, the machine whose code is x accepts x and here no means machine whose code is x does not accept x. right? And here, your final output if he m would have not accepted, then this algorithm would accept and if m would have accepted, the, this algorithm does not accept. So, what I am saying is imagine a new algorithm or a Turing machine, because this is very simple. You just imagine a Turing machine which takes uh, one string as input creates a pair out of it, then invokes the machine which always halts and accepts L u and depending on whether that machine is accepting or rejecting the input, if it is accept, it would have accepted the input, which input? M s input is x x, then this composite machine is going to reject its original input x, otherwise it is no. It is very clear what is this composite machine doing, right. This composite machine would be accepting, see it is accepting here. So, yes by that we mean accept. It accepts if m would have rejected, m would have rejected means the machine whose code is x accepts x, right, uh, does not accept x, right. Only that is the reason m would have rejected this, m rejects its input x x, if and only if machine whose code is x does not accept x. That means, the string x is in the language L D and otherwise the string x would is not in the language L D. So, this whole thing is a machine, Turing machine that always holds and accepts L D. Right. So, now this Turing machine always holds, you see because 
this obviously can be done by a machine this transformation can be done fairly simply and trivially and that there is no problem there is no question of non halting in doing this transformation and uh, this by definition always halts and depending on the answer you are just giving a certain answer you are just switching the two answers. So, in that case this is a machine which always halts and it precisely accepts the language LD. So, that means what that if such a machine exists in other words if LU is recursive then LD is recursive. But we know LD is not recursive because it is not even recursively enumerable. So, from here the conclusion is LU is not recursively not recursive. So, you have shown both these so, these two things we have proved that 1 L u is R e and second thing we just now proved that L u is not recursive. So, therefore, the class R e we can say like this the class R e is a proper superset of the class recursive. Okay. So, indeed the old picture that we drew the two circles remember that we said that this is the class of all languages this is the RE languages, this is the recursive languages, right. So, here is LU, here is LD, and so therefore, recursive is a proper subset of RE. Now, what about the complement of RE? Uh, complement of LU? Clearly, since LU is not recursive, since LU is not recursive, but RE, LU complement is not RE, because if LU of course, we know LU is recursively enumerable. If LU complement is also recursively enumerable, then LU would have been recursive, but we know LU is not recursive. So, LU complement is not recursively enumerable. So, you see I mean you, the, you have these cases that both LD I mean to, to take this language LU, its complement is not recursively enumerable it comes here. So, this also shows this simple observation also shows that RE languages are not closed under complementation. So, this is a property of RE languages whereas, of course, recursive languages are closed under complementation. We will uh, first of all very briefly review some things which you have talked about earlier notion of uh, membership decision problem. A membership decision problem is a membership decision problem. So, membership of what? Membership of some set A, A is a set and the kind of problem you have is that you are given an input which is x 
and to decide what you need to decide is whether x is in A or x is not in A. Right. So, in case x is in A, you will say yes, x is in A and no, you will say no if x is not in A. So, if we have an algorithm to do this correctly, then we say that the membership decision problem of A is decidable and this is called a decision algorithm, existence of a decision algorithm. makes the this corresponding problem, decision problem, membership decision problem decidable. So, what does it mean to say a decision problem is undecidable. That means, no such algorithm exists. Right? Now, also this see there is a correspondence between this notion, a problem decision problem, membership decision problem being decidable and the notion of recursiveness. Now, consider this set or language. point is and this is fairly simple to see, L A is recursive if and only if decision problem, I am not writing membership decision because in the context it is clear, it is membership decision problem for A is decidable. Let us go through the argument quickly. Suppose A is recursive, so there is a Turing machine which always halts and uh, accepts only the strings which are in A, the set A. So, now you can create an algorithm for the for solving the decision problem is that given the input x, you essentially run that Turing machine M if the Turing machine goes to an accepting state, you say yes, otherwise you say no. Right? Since m precisely m always halts, so either it halts in an accepting state or in an uh, you know state which is not accepting. So, in case it halts in an accepting state, you know that x is in A, this condition is satisfied by the input and therefore, answer of the decision is yes, otherwise it is no. And similarly, on the other hand, if I have an algorithm for the decision problem for A, then we have said if something can be done by any algorithm, by church Turing thesis, it can be done by a Turing machine. So, there is a Turing machine to decide whether an input x is in A or not and just turn it into a recognizer that same Turing machine by going to an accepting state if you know the input x is accepted by or input x is in the in the in the set A. So, essentially from an algorithm by invoking church Turing hypothesis we say we claim the existence of a Turing machine which solves the decision problem and from a solution of decision problem by a Turing machine, we get a recognizer for the language L A. So, this is clear. So, some decision problem is undecidable, 
right. So, corresponding to every deci decision problem, we can create the set of yes instances as we did here and that is a language. And if the decision problem is undecidable, that means the corresponding language of yes instances is not recursive, all right. So, what I am trying to say is that uh, undecidability proofs essentially can be couched in the language of languages, show the corresponding language to be not recursive. But one particular problem of undecidability, we would like to prove directly that it is undecidable, because that problem is so well known and all of you might have, I mean I am sure most of you would have heard of this problem and that is called the halting problem. So, halting problem is not really a language problem, but here we what we want though it is about Turing machines, it, the problem is like this. You can state the problem this way that as input you will be given code of a Turing machine and some string let us say w. What you are supposed to decide output yes if m halts on w as input and output no if m does not. So, essentially we are looking for an algorithm which will decide given any Turing machine and some string which is it considered as its input whether the Turing machine would have halted on that string or not. Now, this is a classical problem and it is known that halting problem is undecidable. Halting problem is undecidable, we will try to prove this kind of directly, you will see how it is done. The proof is by contradiction. Okay. So, we will assume, we will start by saying that suppose halting problem is indeed decidable. That means what? There exists some algorithm which decides given m and w as input whether m halts on w or not. Now, existence of such an algorithm immediately means through Church Turing. So, this means let us say first of all existence of an algorithm to decide if m halts on w for input any input m w. Now, here we will invoke church Turing hypothesis to say that this algorithm can be carried out by a Turing machine. So, existence of a particular Turing machine that solves 
the halting problem. Let us name this Turing machine, let us name this Turing machine D, all right. Now, pictorially let us see what D is, something very simple, I mean whatever we said this D, it will take as input something which is like M W. And it will decide. So, remember this is a Turing machine. So, let us also say at this time it says yes means the Turing machine knows that M would accept or M would halt on W, and no means it says that uh, M would not halt on W. So, let us also say that by saying yes, it goes to a, this Turing machine goes to a state from where there is no transition and so therefore, D itself halts there, alright. So, these two are, since no transitions is, are shown, these two are halting states. Now, since D exists, Imagine another machine which something like this that given any string w right or think of this way that given any string which is of course, we know any binary string can be a code of a Turing machine. So, imagine that given any code of a Turing machine, it first of all copies this m. and creates a pair. So, basically see by that what we mean, we essentially we have two copies of codes of M right and now this machine D is there and D as before would look like this, yes and it holds, no it does not hold and no and again it holds. So, this is some transformer which just copies M to that output line with another copy. So, basically now we can see what is happening, when would such a for, for what kind of M's this composite machine will go say will say yes, this composite machine will say yes if and only if the machine M halts on its own description, right. The machine M halts on its own description that will take it to this line. Okay. So, this let us call it the machine E, all right. And now, Let me slightly change E to obtain a new machine F. So, E basically was that it will take code of a machine and it will go to the state if M would halt on its own input uh, 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 halt on its own code as input and it will go to this state if m would not have halted on its own description as input. So, this is where old thing would have said yes, this is no, but instead of writing yes and no. So, let me put this in brackets because now we no longer we are not interested in this kind of output as such that here we go into an infinite loop on any symbol. So, essentially once it comes to this state, 
then it goes to this state and keeps moving here, but this one is as before. Okay. So, this is a, this is a different machine which you obtain from E and call this F the machine F. What happens now if to F you had given the input which is the code of F. So, basically this is F consider the situation where the input is the code of the machine F itself. All right. This is the situation we are considering. So, in now there are two things which are possible that F holds on its own description. Okay, this is case one. Case two is F does not halt on its own description. So, let us take the first case f halts on f, then this machine E when so basically here what what that would have done if this was given f was given as input it would have gone to this state right. Now, f is very similar to E except so therefore, f also on input code f will come here, but once it comes here it goes into an infinite loop right. Then assuming f halts on f we get that f does not halt on f and if we assume let us therefore, may consider the other case does not halt on f. Now, if f does not halt on f, E would have come to this state, this line and come to this state. As we said E and f the only difference is here. So, f also then on given this as input would have come here, but in this case when it comes to this state it halts. So, if we assume f does not halt on f that implies from there we are getting f halts on f. So, what is this situation? This situation is that if f exists we are getting into a contradiction because either it halts on its own description or it does not halt on its own description. In either case, we are getting something ridiculous because if you assume this, then its opposite is true. If you assume the opposite, then that would have been true. So, this is a classical way you say that we have reached a contradiction. What is it that you what is it that this entire thing contradicts? Some assumption that we made, and what is the assumption really that we made? Here we said f exists, but clearly now this f cannot exist. If f cannot exist, e cannot exist. If e cannot exist, of course, t does right, t just copies something, make a copy to it. Only reason e cannot exist is because d cannot exist, and what was d? d was a Turing machine to solve the halting problem. So, therefore, we see a contradiction. and which implies that D does not exist and what we are saying is by this we mean that since D does not exist there is no Turing machine to solve the halting problem and since there is no Turing machine to solve the halting problem there is no algorithm to solve the halting problem therefore, halting problem. is undecidable. 
should spend a couple of minutes on this proof and contrast it with some of the earlier things that we discussed. You should see it also as a diagonalization proof and you should also realize that we could have come to the same conclusion using notions of recursiveness etcetera, but this is a more direct uh, demonstration of a famous problem being undecidable. One final remark, some of you might wonder that the reason we said we got the contradiction was because we tried this kind of stunt that is we gave a machine its own description and that took us to a contradiction. So, is it the case that the halting problem is undecidable because we chose to give such a funny uh, input, but point is if we do not give such inputs, inputs which are codes of itself, codes of the machine or codes of the algorithm, in that case otherwise can we do everything? So, this is a question you can think of and answer to this is no, I mean this is not as simple as that, that the halting problem seen as a function is not computable only at one point, right. So, you can think about that and this is a uh, you know classical problem and we must understand all the nuances of it in a very, very uh, manner for formal as well as you know grasp the intuition behind this proof.